Well, uh, morning everyone. Um, welcome to my kitchen table. <laughs> I've been forced to my office by load shedding. Um, it should be fine. If we do get a, a, a load shedding incident at uh, 10 o'clock in about half an hour, bear with me and I'll just flick it back, but uh, the backup should work. Um, but if there's more dogs and cats than normal, then uh, <laughs> that's why. Anyway, good to see you. Um, Metaverse, very exciting. Um, and we'll talk about markets first. So let's get into it. Okay, so, yeah, let's see, markets, continue at new highs. Um, not only is it, is it as the market doubled, but it's been the fastest doubling in markets um, ever. This shows you it on the far left um, is the blue line, which is us now. All the other lines are previous doublings from uh, the bottoms of markets, um, and they take a lot longer in terms of years, up to five and a half years, up on the right there. And that's the 1974 recovery. Uh, the green one is the 07 recovery from October 07. Um, oh, October 02, sorry. And then the one on the left is the fastest one today. So it's been quick and uh, vicious. And we are now selling at fairly extreme valuations. I've been making this case for a little while. The market's been hovering around its peaks for a little while. Worth a look at this chart. Um, this shows the deviation from the kind of normal growth trend of a market through time back to 1905. And you can see how far it deviates um, from that trend before it collapses in a heap. Um, so 144% above its trend back in the early 1900s before the great crash of 1907. You can see in 1929, before the 1930-31 crash, uh, it was 108% above its uh, long-term trend. Uh, you can see through the roaring 50s, the 1974 crash, 22% ahead. The dot-com dot bubble, we were 104% above our, our normal trend. And then, of course, the dot-com uh, crash. Financial crisis about 8, 49%. And now, on the far right, we are 148% above our normal trend rate. I thought that was a pretty interesting and somewhat unnerving chart in terms of markets. And in terms of the economy, we've been talking about inflation for a little bit. Um, this shows you in red the inflation surprise index, according to Citigroup. So inflation is surprising on the upside. At the same time, the economy in grey there is surprising on the downside. So we're seeing this kind of bounce back from COVID and it's still coming through but it's kind of slowing a little bit. And we're seeing some concerns, obviously, in China. We'll come back onto that one. And inflation is coming through apace. Uh, we've now had four months uh, on the trot of US, US inflation headline above 5%. And that's coming through bottlenecks, partly, in the whole supply chain, which is COVID caused. This shows you how many vessels are waiting at port at the main hubs in the world. So you've got 53 sitting outside Los Angeles on the left. You've got 97, 73 sitting outside the Chinese ports. Maximum waiting time is 12 days now. I mean, they should be turning those around in a day or two. So um, very strong and difficult bottlenecks coming up, particularly to the Christmas period. So a shortage of supply as demand is, is coming through fairly strongly, causing inflation. And this is the problem. You can see here what I talked about in terms of CPI. Um, the core CPI is the dotted line, which is, as you can see, above 5% in the United States today. And you can see the 10-year Treasury yield in America, which is the, the solid line, which generally tracks inflation, and you can see it's decoupled. So um, yields are still low, inflation is very high. We are seeing yields in the States ticking up. We've seen that just in the last, ooh, in the last couple of weeks, really back up to the 1.5%, 1.6% area in terms of the 10-year bond yield. And if that keeps on going up, that becomes a problem for markets. And it's a problem for markets because uh, markets have fed off low interest rates. Excuse the pun. The Fed has kept interest rates low, and markets are fed off that. This is a chart which shows you just the last few years. The Euro, uh, G7 euro dollar rate, this is kind of the global proxy for, for interest rates. You can see this come down from 1.6% to zero um, in response partly to COVID. And you can see um, in the firm line, the world index, which has gone up a lot, as we know, from the bottom as rates were cut. As those rates go up, which they're about to do, more pressure on market valuations. So it's all about the long bond yield in the States. 
And they've been able to keep interest rates low for such a long time, um, for most of our careers, in fact, back to 1995, you can see here, consumer price inflation has been at very low levels. The kind of central bank target rate across there is 2%. Back to 1995, pretty much the whole time, inflation has been below 2%. So you can keep rates obviously very low during that period. Now, inflation, of course, has jumped up. What do we do now? And the problem they've got is this. This is the debt super cycle. Okay? On the left is household debt as a percentage of income. And that went from, what, 70% of income to 130%. That, is, that has come down quite a lot, back to 90%. So private debt has kind of eased. But that's been shifted onto the government, <laughs> as the government have paid out checks, etc., to keep people going. And government debt is now, what's that, from 40% to 110% of GDP. So the debt is sitting at the government level. So the government is, is desperate to keep interest rates low so it can finance its debt. And it also loves quantitative easing because QE is central banks printing money, buying debt from the government, i.e. financing the government, and keeping interest rates low by keeping the bond yield suppressed. This chart shows you uh, for the UK, Bank of England, um, additional QE in dark green, and the UK government's cash requirement in the light green. And you can see in this year, all of the government's cash requirement, its borrowing requirement, has been financed by its central bank. And that's about to come away because all banks, all central banks are now tapering. They're reducing the amount of bonds they're buying. Okay. This is in the US, monthly QE, $120 billion per month. They're now tapering as of now because they want to take that support away from the bond market, away from the economy because they're worried about inflation. This means that um, they'll be very reluctant to increase interest rates as well, despite the fact inflation is going up. So inflation is likely to be more enduring because central banks have to protect the government debt load from higher interest rates. It's an awful conundrum they've got right now. So um, what we're seeing there is likely lower short-term rates for longer despite inflation going up because of this government support because of how much debt is sitting in the government. So that means um, for markets, inflation is likely to go for longer which is a risk for markets. And at the same time, long bond deals are likely to go up anyway. And that will uh, remove a strong underpin for equity markets globally. So again, we're running a lot of risk in terms of offshore equities. Okay, let me spend a moment on China. We talked about China at length last time. I wanted to touch on it again, um, not in terms of the common prosperity and socialism shift, or in terms of their geopolitical ambitions, but in terms of their problems domestically. And their problems domestically are in the property market. The property market has been supporting China for many years, decades. This chart shows you the percentage of gross domestic product, which is accounted for by property activity of one kind or another. This is the red line back to 1997. It was below 10% of GDP. It's now 30% of GDP. And if you take local municipalities in China as one example, one third of the receipts of local government in China come from land sales <laughs> to individuals. One third. That is now kind of coming off uh, for various reasons I'll describe. And one of those reasons, of course, is the famous Evergrande or Evergrande, whatever you want to call it. So Evergrande real estate in China is one, one of the bigger ones. And these charts shows you how levered it has become how much debt is taken on to finance this housing boom? Uh, that's the red line on the left. Its leverage has gone up 22-fold in the last decade. If you take the eight other top real estate companies, their leverage has gone up 10-fold. And the real estate sector as a whole has gone up 4.5-fold. And if you look on the right, Evergrande, this amazed me, as a proportion of the total real estate market, which is $62 trillion in China, which is twice the size of the US real estate market now. Evergrande is 2.5% of the total. And that's the one we're worried about. What about the rest? And we're starting to see them fall over. Two or three went under last week. So the underpin of debt fueled housing boom in China is coming to an end. So 90% of households in China own a home. 
90%. That's the highest rate of home ownership in the world. I couldn't believe that. And since 2018, 90% of new house purchases have been second house purchases, i.e. speculation. So 90% of people own a house, and new house sales, 90% of those are second homes. So that's pure speculative activity. So you've now got, outside of Evergrande, and this amused me, this is the Evergrande um, corporate structure. Don't try and decipher it. It is uh, the usual mess you find in these highly leveraged companies. So let's see how that untangles. But you've got 108 million, <laughs> 108 million empty apartments in China right now, which have been constructed, pre-sold, i.e. financing these companies, and are not being occupied. So you've got a massive glut of property, which is part of the reason the prices, of course, now are coming down. That would be enough to house Canada, France, Germany, Italy, and the UK's populations. <laughs> it's mind-blowing stuff. The Chinese government is very clever and has a central um, control function, and they can control these things to an extent, but the laws of supply and demand and economics are not going to be denied in China. We've got problems in the housing market. And part of that um, comes through to um, the engine of world growth, which has been China for the last 20 years. And that is reflected to some extent in its demand for commodities. It is sucking in between a third and half of all commodities globally. Cement, 59% of world demand goes to China. 50% of all copper goes to China. 50% of steel, 56% of nickel, it's half the world's coal goes to China. If China slows down, commodities come down, world growth goes down. In the meantime, as we're talking about commodities, we have an interesting trend going on. It's called decarbonization. And capital is being withdrawn by pension funds, by your clients, by investors, by banks. Capital is being withdrawn from fossil fuel investment for good reason. For good ESG reasons, we need to protect the environment. Get it, we need to do that. But it's coming out awfully quickly. And that means that there's less investment into coal, less coal being produced. And what's happening, the price of coal is going up because we're nowhere near a renewable um, electricity economy yet. So we will be dependent on coal for a long period of time still, and you can't just withdraw it all because the price is going up. So the price of coal, you can see there, China coal in the middle, that's doubled this year. Um, and people are switching from coal to natural gas, which is seen as cleaner. <laughs> so the price of gas has gone up even more. So US natural gas is up sixfold this year. UK natural gas up fivefold. Um, Brent crude has been incredibly strong, but hardly registered on this chart. It's up about 40% this year. So this decarbonization agenda is a little bit dangerous in the near term because it's causing energy shortages. And that in itself is leading to higher electricity prices, which is leading to more inflation. Not a great um, combination of events. And you can see the extent of, of um, capital expenditure coming out of energy investment or fossil fuel invest investment here. This is capital expenditure of the energy sector in the, U in the US. Oh, that was $400 billion a year back in 2015. And within five years, it's halved to $200 billion a year. It's gone from 16% of sales to 4% of sales. Uh, sorry, 16% to 8%. So it's halved. So CapEx is halved. So this is a, a real problem. We need to, need to be environmentally friendly, yes, but we need a proper plan to get to decarbonization. And what we've got to do is up the production from renewables. I enjoyed this. Um, sorry, this is the last one on coal. A German power plant right, just ran out of coal. And China's, Chinese power plants have run out of coal. So China's ramping up coal production now to try and uh, compensate for that. So what we need is more renewables. And I enjoyed this map. This is actually a map <laughs> of the great winemaking regions in the world. Those were the Mediterranean climate, which means plenty of rain, plenty of sun, and as it turns out, plenty of wind. What is also is great renewable energy places. Um, you could easily map on top of this. So, uh, Northern Africa, Southern Mediterranean, um, Australia, uh, South America, Western Coast, California, and dear old Western Cape and South Africa. 
and we have the ideal renewable wind and solar environment, we, we would have a chance at least of getting base load out of wind and solar. And that's the other point. Coal provides base load. Renewables don't generally provide base load because the wind doesn't always blow and the sun doesn't always shine. Um, so we need coal and we're going to need a lot more nuclear. This is why the uranium price has gone from $30 a ton to $60 a ton in the last two months. That's going to go higher. We're going to need more uranium, more nuclear. That is a very clean fuel while it's running. Decommissioning, not another question. So we need that base load sorted. And we have a, a wonderful strategic advantage in South Africa because we can also provide a lot of renewables in terms of wind and solar, which is why at all Mutual we're putting a lot of money into that on behalf of our clients with the support of the government. Okay, a couple of snippets about uh, interesting things going on in space. Um, China is busy building its own space station and will build um, mega ships for humans to live in space. Um, these will include commerce, they'll include tourism trips, uh, and they'll include, of course, research. Meanwhile, um, lunar resources, um, and, and, and a big part, by the way, of the renewable energy and electric vehicle revolution is green metals, rare earths, lithium, all these things which, which inhabit electric vehicles and batteries and your phone. And a lot of those minerals reside either on asteroids or on the moon. So we can get them here, but 80% of rare earth production is in China. That's a problem. <laughs> and without rare earths, no phone works. Just doesn't work. We need rare earths, uh, like niobium, etc. They are in plentitude on asteroids and on the moon. So we will be mining on the moon, I would say, within five years. Okay. My slides are frozen for some reason. Um, but I want to get on to the metaverse, and I'm not entirely sure why they're frozen. Maybe I'll just talk about the metaverse next. Not sure if that's moved at your end. Um, okay, let me just pause the slides. Oh, there's the metaverse. It's come up. Okay, cool. Let's move on straight on to that. All right. We have enough time to talk about the metaverse. This is, this is actually more exciting and real than I thought it was going to be. Okay, we talked about the metaverse in passing a couple of sessions ago. Let's define what it is. Meta is Latin for beyond, and verse is the universe. So the metaverse is beyond the universe. It is a parallel digital world, which we inhabit in digital form as avatars. Okay, so right now you put your 3D goggles on, you wear a sensor suit, and you walk around, and you look around, and you move on with it. You literally move within the metaverse with other people who are doing the same thing. You inhabit... Um, physically, digitally, that world. You go to art galleries, you go to curated museums, you go to gardens, you go to houses, you talk to people. That's the metaverse vision, okay? It was actually first prophesized in 1992, um, I now find out, in a science fiction novel by Neil Stevenson called Snow Crash. I'm going to read that book. And he defined it exactly as that, humans as avatars in 3D virtual space as metaphors, as a metaphor of the real world. You've got to spot that is the metaverse. Popularized, of course, subsequent to that in the film, The Matrix, where um, a dystopian future is described, where the machines now are in charge of the world and have tricked humans into living within a metaverse, which is the matrix, and the machines use us as an energy source to supply power to them. Somewhat terrifying, but we're trapped in that uh, that metaverse. So that's a dystopian version of, of what I'm talking about. So the future, in terms of the metaverse, will involve us buying things to inhabit that world. We'll, we'll, we'll want the right-looking avatar. We won't look like ourselves. We'll be big or small or fit or whatever it is. So we'll need avatar designers. We'll need fashion designers. We'll want real estate architects. We'll want interior designers. We might want a nice car. Um, and we will shift from these big clunky Oculus glasses to these probably, or and then an implant in your eye, where you can just flick into the, into the metaverse whenever you want to, and inhabit that. This this will be a real thing. This is a big deal. In the meantime, it's all a bit clunky, and it's kind of started um, in the gaming uh, world. Fortnite is a good example. And things like um, rope, oh, sorry, let me click on this. Things like Roblox, 
So my slides got a bit clunky again. Uh, forgive me for that. And by the way, I'm going to go back to the last one. <laughs> well, I was researching this. Um, you can you can get into these places, and this is a typical metaverse concert right now. So you can see in the background a screen with a guy playing guitar. And Ariana Grande played a concert really recently this year. Uh, I think two million people turned up, and you get all these little avatars kind of moving around. And they're kind of wandering around. This is a screenshot. This is a video. They kind of wander around the place, and, and there's a really big guy with this with a diving suit on. I don't know why, and it's very clunky and it's kind of weird, but people seem to love it. Um, so at the moment, we're at that early stage, kind of early stage internet type stuff. It's all a bit clunky. It's all a bit slow. Um, and a lot of it is in the gaming in, um, community. So the, the gaming community is a great place for Metaverse to start because it's a highly immersive experience, gaming. So you're kind of in it anyway. Um, it's a young um, audience. It's a very crypto-friendly audience. And they're really buying into this. But right now, the things like Roblox, this one, if you go into the Roblox Metaverse, and by the way, there are lots of metaverses set up, okay, which you can inhabit. The dream is to connect them all. So one is Roblox. Roblox, before you discard it, Roblox is capitalized currently on the US Stock Exchange at 50, 50 billion dollars. Okay. This is it, screenshot. It has 40 million daily users. This game's for kids mostly. There's a crypto coin called uh, Robux, which you use to pay for things on Roblox. And $650 million has already been spent in Robux in this game in the last year. You've spent it on hats, clothes, hot air balloons. A lady sold a Gucci handbag on Roblox, a digital Gucci handbag for $4,000 two weeks ago. That's more than the physical bag would be worth because people want to walk around with a Gucci handbag with their avatar. It's already developing a darker side. <laughs> There are enclaves being set up by the community, strip clubs, sex parties, awful things going on, but that's that's in the in the background. But this thing is happening, and it's happening really fast. The other one that caught my eye was Axie Infinity. This is one of the bigger ones. And Axie Infinity realized um, a, a very crucial thing, which is NFTs, non-fungible tokens. NFTs are uh, permanent digital records of a digital object which then belong to you. So if I buy a suit for my avatar, it then belongs to me in this digital world. You couldn't do that before. Ownership is critical to the creation of this real world and NFTs have created digital ownership. That's why NFTs were so incredibly important. They only came out six months ago, okay? And for these games, I can now own my own Axie. An Axie is in the middle, one of these little creatures, and I buy it. And I own it, and I own that little guy, and I fight with it, and I do whatever I want in this digital land. You could say, so what? Well, the most expensive Axie bought so far, 300 ethers, which are Ethereums, 300 ethers, $4,000 per ether. That's a half a million dollar Axie. Because he happened to wear a good suit and was very strong and great weapons. I kid you not, half a million dollars for an Axie in this world. 90,000 Ethereum traded so far. That is $360 million of value. It's been traded in Axie Infinity in the last year. Half a million daily users. You can buy real estate in this Axie land. Interestingly, the other thing about this is it's a play to earn game, okay? So you breed these Axies, you fight with them, and if you win, um, other people will buy your Axies from you. So it's a play to earn model. And this took off in Indonesia, in Manila in the last year, where um, people were having a very tough time in COVID, and they found that if you played this game and you bred axes, you could sell them. So it became a play-to-earn model, which again is revolutionary, revolutionizing gaming. So there's a company called Yield Guild Games, which owns this, and lends money to poor people in Manila to buy an initial axe so they can fight and can breed themselves and can then sell them on. They lend them the money, the money gets paid back, and then they take a revenue share. You can buy coins in Yield Guild Games, YGG. Google it. You can buy a coin in this in this organization and benefit from, from that trend. Yield Guild Games also own something called League of Kingdoms. Um, and they have bought real estate in League of Kingdoms. Um, castles and things. <laughs> and they own land there. But it's clunky. It's kind of old-style gaming. It's not, not really you know, where you want to be in the metaverse yet. It's, it's very kind of young stuff. 
But we are getting there. There's something called Decentraland, which looks a little bit more like a kind of a vaguely normal type of world you'd want to hang out in. Um, it's a better look and feel. Sotheby's, the auctioneer in London, have just bought a plot for a replica of their London gallery in the art district in Decentraland. Their first show attracted 3,200 visitors of NFT digital art. It's happening. A company called Republic Realm paid 1.2 million mana. Mana is the crypto for De Decentraland. 1.2 million mana is about a million dollars. They paid a million dollars for 259 plots to build on in Decentraland. There are casinos in Decentraland, and you can get a job there as a croupier to man the roulette table, and you get paid in manners to do it. The total mana stock is now worth $2.4 billion, the mana crypto, $2.4 billion from nothing a year ago, which tells you, by the way, and this is important, that crypto coins are a commodity. So think about crypto as something you need to make something happen. Okay, in the same way you need to buy copper to build a copper wire to join networks up, or you need to buy lithium to make a battery. Lithium and copper are commodities. The more you need them, the more valuable they are, the more price goes up. You need Ethereum as the backbone of all of this we're talking about. You need mana to live in Decentraland. You buy mana. It's a commodity which facilitates trading in Decentraland. That's why crypto, are, all these cryptos are going up. They are commodities. They're not currencies. Very important to realize. The downside of Decentraland, it, it's only kind of half built. It's pretty barren. If there's no, there's no art to see, and there's no concert going on. You kind of, people wander around doing nothing. So it's kind of early days, but people are buying apartments there. And you can buy lots of things. These prices are in mana. This is, this is the equivalent of the Amazon buy list in Decentraland. You can buy, uh, what's that, a hat for your avatar. You can buy a dress. You can buy whatever those other things are, hoodie. So it's 10 bucks, 10 mana, which is $10 for a hat. And then you can buy real estate at the bottom. Okay. These look a bit cheap to me, to be honest, but maybe not. So you can buy an apartment on the left for 12,200 mana. You can buy a plot for 10,000 mana. Again, that's $10,000, which is pretty much the same. Or a closet. Was that a closet? Closest thing. Maybe that's a, a, another house. 15,000. So it's about 10 to $15,000 for an apartment <laughs> in this world. It's happening. I'll come back to all of this to bring it all together. And then kind of uh, almost the final slide. It's, 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 this is a bit of a more real world view would understand. So Facebook has launched its um, metaverse and Facebook is looking to change its own name to a metaverse friendly name as a corporation. This is how important I think it's going to be. So it's called Facebook Horizon Workroom. So this would be us today. We, we, we don our seats, be avatars together in a room, as opposed to staring at the screen <laughs> like this together. We'll be staring at each other in a room, avatars together. That's a better experience digitally, actually. You can see how you could step into your screen and be with people. So that's the thing to get your head around. In terms of our new digital way of interacting, that's a nice way to do it. It's almost 10 o'clock. I'm hoping this is not going to go off. <laughs> um, so anyway, so the advantage of that, you can be together, you can gesture, you can put a screen, you can write things. And it's actually, I must say, pretty cool. We want to get away from the clunky glasses, but it's pretty cool. And we're going to need, for example, probably in our homes, dedicated metaverse rooms where you can sit and be a rabbit and move around and do your stuff and look weird, kind of closed off. And that is it. So there's lots of implications of this metaverse. This is what I want to get to. One of them is physical space to inhabit when you're in your digital world. That's an obvious implication. We're going to need a different living space. But as this thing becomes better looking and better um, managed and a better experience and you're wearing glasses, not huge things, and you're in you know, the kind of a cool kind of world where you've got your avatar, what are the implications? There are many implications of this. And my, my close will be this is real, it's happening, and there's money to be made. And we're still going. It's 10 o'clock. This is cool. Okay, I'm going to list them. Number one, all of these things, NFTs, gaming, um, ownership of things in digital worlds, smart contracts which make it happen, blockchain technology, the facilitator for all of these is Ethereum. Okay? 
Ethereum is going to be even bigger than it is today. It's capitalized at $400 billion today. It will be multiples of that, in my opinion, in the years to come. It is the, the foundation. It is the commodity which you need to make all this happen. That's number one. Number two, many of these, 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 these stores of value, these metaverses, are what's called decentralized autonomous organizations, DAOs, decentralized autonomous organizations. They're the new form of company. And you buy into them by buying these coins and being part of that community. And as the thing gets bigger, your coin becomes worth more. It's like share ownership through coin ownership. And that decentralized nature of a community is a really nice way to, to facilitate growth uh, in this world. And that'll come into our real world as well, I think. Number three, um, NFTs, so important, they allow ownership. They allow what's called tokenization. Okay. So again, going back to our normal corporates, let's say MTN. MTN in the future will be tokenized and you'll get direct ownership as a token of MTN, not a share traded on exchange, but a token. So the private and public worlds morph completely together. So tokenization is huge for everything. Number four, this will change the internet as we know it. The internet now is controlled by Facebook and Google, basically. They control all the feeds, 80% of them. That gateway model will change to a decentralized blockchain-based, community-based internet. That's going to be the biggest threat to Facebook, which is why they're so keen to get into the metaverse. Next, shared spaces where we can be digitally together mean less travel, fewer emissions. We can be with our loved ones across continents. We can be creative together in these digital environments as avatars. It's going to happen. It's going to equalize opportunities globally because everyone can participate in that level playing field. So emerging markets come in. doesn't matter if you're in Indonesia or California. You can still be in the same avatar world. And I think it's fantastic for emerging markets and, and less developed countries. Question is, how does scarcity work <laughs> in this world? Okay, so you're buying land in one metaverse. Why would that be valuable when I can set up the metaverse tomorrow? There seems to be unlimited, unlimited supply of ownership. So it'll either be that, that, that it's a fool's errand to buy real estate in a metaverse, or it'll be you're an early adopter and you're an early colonizer in what becomes New York City. <laughs> and New York City is valuable because it's become a hub. It's not because of a piece of land or because it's called New York City. It's, it's become people want to be there because other people are, be, are there and provide all kinds of goods and services to that particular piece of land. So it could be that these early metaverses, if they get it right, that's the desirable place to live. And that creates the scarcity of real estate. So early adopters, they could be spot on in buying these crazily priced NFTs and parcels of land. Crypto I've talked about, it's a commodity. I've explained why, it's like copper or lithium. It's a facilitator of these worlds. It's not a currency, it's not an asset class, it's a commodity. Uh, Ethereum is the one to have. Oh, we'll have careers um, in this world. We'll have avatar designers. We'll have furniture. Uh, we'll have furniture designers. We'll have interior designers, clothes designers, car designers. We'll have retail workers, casino operators, uh, restaurant operators, people manning the concert. We'll have IT help in, in the digital. Uh, there's, there's it's a whole new career, digital career pathway for our children. My children are already working on visual design in this digital world to facilitate these kinds of worlds. This is happening really fast now. So how do we play it? Well, you can buy gaming stocks. So I think it starts with gaming stocks. And gaming stocks go from a subscription model to a I want to buy things from you model. So they can monetize all these visuals they have. They can sell you things. So I think the economics for gaming stocks is transformed, be it electronic arts, be it Activision Blizzard, who own Call of Duty, uh, take two interactive solutions with our own Grand Theft Auto, Epic Games, which are on Fortnite. And again, it, it's, it's the place to start, it's the right community, it's an immersive crypto community. You can buy the software providers or the hardware providers, Unity Software, uh, Tiny Immersion, Qualcomm. You can buy Yield Guild Games, which own some of these games. Um, or you can buy the ETF, <laughs> Exchange Traded Fund, which owns all these things which is always the right way to do it because you capture the trend without stock-specific risk. 
the ETF which owns all these things is called Meta, M-E-T-A, that's the ticker, M-E-T-A, Meta, for Metaverse. Um, it's currently got $140 million in it. It's small and it's new. It's got 40 names. It's got all these names to benefit from this. When we launch our Applied Intelligence Fund, which I will run, the AI Fund, it will be one of the ETFs we own alongside quantum computing and AI and robotics, etc. Because this Metaverse is going to be a real thing and it's going to be massive. So Meta is the way to play it. Um, look it up. That's the ticker. So the final conclusion. Metaverse a much bigger deal than I realized. It's going to be a real thing that's happening awfully quickly and it's going to be enormous. What do, how do you play that? You do two things. And I'm not allowed to give stock recommendations, but from my point of view, Meta is really interesting <laughs> to track this trend and make money out of it, that ETF. And secondly, Ethereum. I've been positive on Ethereum for quite a while now as the chosen crypto. It is a facilitator of this new world and it will become much bigger than it is today. I'm pretty much out of time and um, I haven't looked at too many of the questions, a lot of load shedding questions, so I will leave those, we'll pick them up later. I hope that was helpful and happy investing and um, let's go make some money. Nice to see you.